are, Mother Flowers. Welcome back to another Gutter Fighting Secrets Tactical Podcast. Today, we're joined by Mr. Robert I. Taylor. Now, Robert is a really interesting character. He is a Vietnam-era pilot with service in Vietnam proper. Um, he is also a paramedic, uh, registered nurse in the state of Florida, and uh, also in Texas, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, Rob completed his MS degree in systems management, aerospace IT um, from USC. He's got his BBA in international business from the University of Houston. Um, ADN RN graduate from Lone Star College in Montgomery. And um, so it's just a whole list of these accomplishments, Rob. But I mean, I'm going to hit just really the bullet points here. Um, Commanding Officer 2nd Medical Battalion, Texas State Guard, 2007 to 16. Um, Ham radio operator with the Montgomery County County Amateur Radio Emergency Service, A-R-E-S, active member of the Montgomery County Medical Reserve Corps, which is pretty cool. Firefighter, paramedic, um, and technical information specialist uh, for the Texas Task Force 1. Very cool and Montgomery County uh, Precinct 81 uh, election judge, 13 to 2017. So I left a couple of things out there, man, just for time's sake, but I appreciate you coming on. Thanks. I so, enjoyed talking to you. So, Rob, likewise, the pleasure is all mine, by the way. Um, I'm really thrilled to be having this discussion with you because there's so much here, um, but I want to kind of start – I guess kind of towards the top of your resume with every, everyone wants to know about Vietnam stuff, right? Like these days, right. it's such a cool guy thing to have been over there. You went over there with the Air Force and um, what kind of planes were you flying over there? Um, actually, I was flying what they call tactical airlift. Um, it was a C-123, which is a provider. It's a twin engine airplane, twin, uh, twin propellers, but two outdo- outboard jets. And uh, they tasked us with carrying general cargo around, but uh, sometimes we actually went into, uh, uh, well, we, it was a uh, st- uh, short takeoff and landing aircraft. So they could knock down about eight or 900 feet of forest or jungle and clean it up and put pure steel planking down and we could land on it. Um, we did some stuff uh, mainly, you know, carrying ammunition in to places that were, uh, m- might be overrun if they didn't have the ammunition. Mm. And, um, you know, I'm pretty proud of it. I wasn't a fighter, fighter jock, but, uh, uh, I, I, I did my service and, uh, you know, a couple, a couple of times we saved some guys from getting overrun. Uh, actually they got overrun, but we pulled them out. Wow. We, we landed and got some guys on and uh, put them, uh, strapped them down to pallets, actually, and uh, took off with them. Wow. So, Did you spend any time in Saigon? Yes. In fact, um, the last three months of my tour there, I was in Saigon. Wow. wow. Is it like what it's like in the movies? Me love you long time type of thing? Uh, some of it was. Wow. Uh, actually, it was, if you can imagine a a European city 30 years before that Mm. Saigon had sort of been trapped in a time warp almost. Uh, Well, the French, you know, it was a French colony for a while. And uh, so a lot of the, uh, a lot of the restaurants are French restaurants, excellent food, Mm. excellent food. Of course, you know, I I left and then the North Vietnamese took over. So I'm not sure exactly what the state of the state of the city is now. Yeah, I'm sure it's not as nice as when it was uh, kind of a free market going on, but at the same That's time, correct. yeah. But yeah. yes, there was the uh, uh, the bar girls were everywhere. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, that had to have been a an interesting experience. Were there ever times over there where you were kind of shitting a brick, so to speak? Uh, yes, once. Well, more than once, uh, but uh, one comes to mind. I was actually, we were delivering rice to a refugee camp right on the Cambodian border. And um, little did we know the, uh, the Viet Cong had actually 
dialed it in with their mortars. They had the runway dialed in with mortars. We landed, took over to a ta uh, taxied over to a t uh, you know a offload area, had all of our doors open, all of our engines shut down, uh, unloading rice and mortar rounds started going in. Wow. And uh, that was the only time I felt. I mean, we got shot at and stuff, but it's hard to hit a plane, uh, you know, with a with should I say a, a shoulder shoulder fired rifle. It's just mm -hmm. Just really hard to hit a plane. Even if you hit a plane, it doesn't do much to us. So, yeah, yeah. What's that like, though? I mean, I would assume that you can feel it if you get shot, even with a seven six two round or something. You could probably, yes, feel you're getting shot. We we had Kevlar panels in the cockpit with us, hmm. and uh, I have to tell you the truth. I think I got one round once. The guys found it and they covered it with what they call a hundred mile an hour tape. Actually, you can, there's some tape that's really sticky that, uh, and they put us back in service actually. Um, so that was that was not a big deal. The, the mortaring was a big deal because I had to, we had to close up, start the engines and, and taxi out to the runway. We couldn't take off from right where we were because we had to get to the runway and the guy was marching uh, mortar rounds down the runway but uh, he uh, actually, we got between two, two rounds. He was marching down the runway. We, we, we were before one and after another. So uh, he, uh, uh, the guy who was shooting it uh, just missed us. That's all. Wow. wow. Yeah. I always think about that, especially for pilots. It, it's gotta be a weird feeling. You know, you go, on a mission and then you go on another one and you go on another one. And did you ever feel like, Oh, I hope my luck stays with me out here. <laughs> um, we were, like I say, I was flying in South Vietnam. I wasn't okay. up there with the, you know, the one Oh fives and F fours and stuff really getting shot at by Sam's and stuff. So, uh, uh, but we, we had our own risks that we, and we knew where we could go without getting blown up. So, uh, Except for the couple of times, like say that that one, uh, because we didn't we didn't have any intel on it, so mm -hmm. it was just a refugee camp. And we were delivering rice, and that was it. And the uh, NVA were shooting mortars at the refugee camp. They had undoubtedly a well. In fact, that was the third aircraft in there. They saw them come in. The first two, uh, they had already. Uh, should I say, got their aiming sticks on the runways. So all they had to do is just start popping rounds in when, when we landed. So, uh -huh. so they were shooting at the Americans at the refugee camp. Not they, weren't, they weren't wasting their mortar rounds on the refugees. Yeah. No. Yeah. So after you were done fighting communists, you came back. Is that when you got your um, degrees or was that before you joined the air force? After I got out of the air force, I went to, well, actually, uh, University of Southern California had a program where they sent uh, professors to air bases. Instead of us going to the college, the college sent their professors to us. And uh, uh, if we stayed in the program long enough, all of the all of the uh, courses that we needed to take would have been delivered to us on base. Wow! I got out before I had actually finished the whole program, so I had to go in in. Uh, it, what am I trying to say? Going to Los Angeles to USC to finish the program. Probably was nice coming out of uh, the service and then going into a college, meeting all the chicks out there, hanging out. Yes, yeah. yes. especially Los Angeles. Yeah, yeah, it's so, a beautiful area out beaches, that way. The beaches were nice. Yeah, yeah. You're a native Spanish speaker as well. I think I left that out on the introduction, but um, I'm sorry, not native Spanish speaker, but um, a very fluent Spanish speaker. And you actually um, went over there for a little while uh, to Mexico during your sophomore year. Am I correct? That's correct. My, well, my bachelor's degree was in international business and the program required that I take, uh, or I didn't have to take a year, but I had to master a language. And since I was from Texas or not originally from Texas, but I'd spent a lot of time in Texas, I figured I'd go into Mexico and take Spanish. Hmm. So, I wasn't living in Mexico for a little while. Uh, it was fine at that point. 
that was in the uh, mid sixties and things were sort of fun, really. You know? Yeah. That was uh, the Johnny cash era where it was like pretty cool to be over in Mexico outlaw living. Yes. Yeah. yes, it was. Rank of uh, ma- major in the uh, Texas state guard. Did you join the guard? I guess after you got out of the air force, after you got your That's degree correct. in business. Yeah. Uh, Texas state guard is uh, a state defense force that uh, we, uh, our boss is the governor of the state. We can't be federalized. And um, I joined in 2007, I think, yes. And um, uh, I already had a paramedic and I was a captain when I uh, uh, separated from the Air Force. So they bumped me one grade and brought me into the Texas State Guard. I was a, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. No, I was just saying that I became a commander or a unit commander after I'd been there about three, three years and uh, finally figured out how everything worked uh, in the Texas State Guard. So that's an interesting concept that it's not the National Guard. It's a state guard. So you guys can't be federalized. You can't be told to go and guard Congress. <laughs> you can't be told to do this and that. If, you know, if the governor of Texas doesn't want you to do it, you're not going to do it, right? That's correct. Uh, it is part of U.S. code that states can create uh, state self-defense units. Uh, Georgia has a very active one. Texas has a very active one. I'm trying to think. I think Maryland does. Um, I'm in Florida right now and they have passed legislation enabling the state to create that, that particular one, but uh, there is not a state defense force in Florida. Harkens back to the old militia days. Sort of. Uh, we, uh, the reason they did it, it actually it was prior to World War, uh, no, during World War II when all of the National Guard guys had been federalized and were headed to Europe and, uh, you know, the Western Pacific. And uh, the governors were unhappy that they had lost all of their National Guard members. So the U.S. Congress authorized them to, to raise their own militia groups. Hmm. Although we, we don't like to be called militia because of that, that has sort of a funny connotation, especially now. So especially now. Um, it's, my, it's, my cat has decided to, to uh, join us. Sorry. You got your own militia right there. <laughs> it's all good. We're, we always welcome the uh, felines on the Tactical Podcast yeah. as well. The militia, that's something interesting that you bring up there. Um, you know, it used to be, I guess, really an honorable thing, right? We know about the Minuteman and Battle of Concord and Lexington and all of that. They saved our ass in the Revolution. But they also saved our ass in the Battle of Eight or War of 1812. And I think they had some other action, maybe a Spanish-American War, I'm not sure. But uh, somewhere down the line, maybe in the 90s or 80s, it became like kind of a fringe thing. You think of like anti-government guys with tinfoil hats in the woods looking for black helicopters. But you know, even though it's kind of a, a different time now, well, it really is a different time, you know, the militia really is kind of an important thing, an important thing in American culture, in my opinion. Well, it's, it's in the, actually the Second Amendment to the Constitution. You know, a well-regulated mission or militia being a good thing, uh, uh, nobody can take our uh, weapons away from us, theoretically. Yeah, theoretically, <laughs> theoretically. So um, you got your RN. Did you get your paramedic before you did RN? Yes. In fact, I was a paramedic for 20 plus years. Uh, That's impressive. In, in Houston. Well, I was a paramedic part-time. Actually, I was doing uh, IT work more than, I mean, as far as my primary income was from IT work. I did the uh, paramedic thing more or less, uh, and I hate I hate to use this term. I did it for fun because it was I was sort of an adrenaline junkie from the get uh, from the get go. So, yeah, I can see that. Um, and you're also a retired firefighter, am I correct? That's correct. I went into burning houses and uh, until I. 
finally aged up to the point where I decided it was best not to go into burning houses with a hose. Yeah, you've got an expiration date on you of being a firefighter. That's that's <laughs> for sure. It's some yes. guys don't want to admit it, but that's um, correct. I uh, I give you props for being uh, doing the paramedic thing for fun because I mean I went through EMT school and I had a very hard time with that. I'm not too proud to admit that. So I talked to you know other guys I know got their paramedic. They got they went through about a year of training with all their clinicals and everything like that. I forget how many countless hours they have to spend in the hospital, but it's a really big deal. Um, and then once you get your paramedic license for the guys and girls out there who don't know, you've got to maintain your CEUs and your continuing education credits. And it's not an easy feat to get no. it, to keep it. In fact, it's easier being, an, it's actually be easier being a nurse than it is a paramedic because uh, you have a, you get a license when you finally get through all of the, the, things that you have to do a paramedic gets a certification that expires every four years and you have to retest you have to re uh, you have to do your skills testing and you actually have to uh, re-exam uh, depending on what state you're in it varies but nursing ce is a little bit easier actually i mean that's interesting re-upping re so yeah i i didn't know that actually i mean Maybe, maybe I had heard it, but it's fascinating you brought up the difference between a certification and a license, whereas that certification, like you say, it expires, but the license, is that good for pretty much forever or? You have to, well, uh, continuing education, I, I think I had to do, I want to say 48 hours every two years wow. of, of CE. I'm, I'm not even sure it's that many, but it's it's enough that you have to go uh, get into the books and, uh, and the state of Florida, for instance, has sp specific things, uh, like, uh, uh, I'm trying to think, uh, Oh, uh, uh, uh tra human trafficking okay. actually is one of the thing. Well, they, they give you ideas and indications of human trafficking. If you, uh, if you, you, say you're working in the emergency room and somebody comes in and all the numbers don't add up in your own head about why that person's here. Uh, they've got a minder who's watching them and they're, they're giving us ideas on how to sort of pinpoint someone and maybe getting uh, law enforcement involved. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. I've always heard about that too. Um, you know, <laughs> going into the hospital with gunshot wounds, for example, you know, it's not yeah. that simple. Like, okay, we'll treat you and just let you out. Like there's going to be that's, some questions. That's actually pretty automatic now. I mean, uh, somebody comes in with a gunshot wound, it has to be reported. Yeah. You don't have a choice. <laughs> um, you and I were talking a little bit before uh, we went live about the vaccine and you just got vaccined yourself. Um, I got mine last night. What did you get, the Pfizer or the uh, Moderna? Moderna. Wow. And um, like I said, uh, I got mine in January and my first one. And I'm due for the second one next Tuesday. So, Well, congratulations, first of all. You step towards normal life <laughs> and um, a step towards freedom, in my opinion. I know a lot of our audience is afraid of the vaccine. And I won't say it like that because that sounds a little demeaning. Not afraid, but they're apprehensive about the vaccine. My wife is actually one of those. Yeah, believe it or not. So she, she and I have, uh, how should I say, uh, discussions about it. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine you too. The thing that gets me, man, is um, you're an RN. You've been in medicine your entire life almost, and you're explaining to her, "Hey, listen, hun, like this is fine. It's not changing your DNA and making you a Democrat or anything like that." Why or is it a microchip? <laughs> well, look, I was having this discussion on the live chat the other day with someone, and I'll leave his name out of it, but he was saying it's the mark of the beast. It's the mark of the beast. I don't know. I'm not an expert in Bible history, but I do know that a number of things have to happen before we take the mark of the beast, and they give it to you in your right hand or your forehead. So I didn't get the vaccine in my forehead. I know that. No. Yeah. But hey, that's me. And, you know, it, I think when you went through a little bit of medical training or a lot in your case, you have a better understanding about these things. That's yeah.
Yeah. And uh, we know some of the processes that are going on in the background that I know that if they released a vaccine, there was so much scrutiny in the whole process during this nine months that they, you know, uh, did it all. There was no way anybody could have cheated. Yeah. Uh, as far as I'm concerned. And I, my rea- I had a reaction to the first shot slightly, but I mean, it was more like itch and uh, at my sh- shoulder hurt for one day. And after that, it itched a little bit. And that was about it. Okay. Yeah. I don't, I didn't, I don't, I can't tell if it's psychosomatic or not. I mean, a slight headache, but who knows? Maybe I was just looking at the computer too much. So hopefully uh, the second dose for you goes well. And, you know, for me as well, I, I really think though, that the, like the more people we can get to take this gosh damn thing, uh, the faster we're all going to be able to get back to like an open economy and making money again, which is absolutely. Yeah. I, I completely agree. You were actually telling me that um, you're a commanding officer in the uh, second medical battalion, Texas state guard. And, so are you currently with the medical battalion with the guard? Or? No, no, I'm, I aged out actually. <laughs> um, and I'm, I'm in Florida. So uh, okay. I moved, well, uh, they retired me in 2016. And, um, and uh, so it was, it was time, you know, uh, I enjoyed my time with them, but I was getting uh, a little long of tooth. So. And plus, so uh, we're, we're sort of the, uh, almost a fire fireman, uh, type of deal for the state. You know, if they have a hurricane hit somewhere, we wind up going either, uh, to a hospital that's already been hit and maybe the personnel or can't even get to the hospital. We'll go in and help them man a hospital failing that if there's no hospital if all the hospitals gotten blown away we'll set up a a temporary hospital in tents so that's the idea that's different than the medical reserve corps uh yes uh we actually had some equipment we actually could go somewhere and set up a uh a temporary hospital and we had enough people to to man it so yeah, I was watching some documentary or something about that on YouTube um, about the Medical Reserve Corps, that is, and how you guys will literally in, in just deploy kind of anywhere across the state in case of biological warfare or natural disaster. Right. Um, we, were, we were trained actually in, uh, uh, by the National Guard uh, uh, I'm trying to think. C. Bernie. I, yes. I don't remember what acronym that is. Uh, C. Bernie. Com, uh, chemical, chemical, biological, uh, uh, whatever it is. Um, by their their instructors on uh, medical response to those kinds of things. So huh. now, what do you think about this gosh damn Wuhan virus? You think it was? Uh, some kind of agent, biological agent? I can only give you an opinion. Okay. So my opinion is the Chinese were messing with, they were, they were weaponizing. This is my opinion. They were weaponizing the coronavirus and putting it, we're we're just going to stockpile it somewhere in that Wuhan complex. And some of it got out. Uh, the, some of the back channel stuff we've heard from people said the Chinese are not nearly as careful about those things as we are. So my, my speculation is that it wasn't intentional, uh, but they were just clumsy. That's what I'm hearing too. Um, from various sources, some of them pretty, pretty official who I would, I would care to believe. And, um, we got the WHO team there in where are they Beijing and Wuhan right now, um, you know, on a fact finding mission, but well, I it's too late time. now. The, the, yeah. the cat is out of the bag, so to speak. I have a hard time believing that they're going to come up with anything different than the official narrative, you know? Yeah, you're right. Yeah. What do you think about, um, 
our new prez putting us back in, on board with the WHO. Do you think it's a good thing, bad thing, and different? I think it's a it's a minor irritation for the for for the American people. It me as an American citizen, it's not going to make a, a big difference one way or the other. The WHO uh, gets some of our tax money, you know, and uh, they run around trying to prevent uh, Ebola virus and this, that, and the other. And they have a role to play, but they, it's turned into a political football, so to speak, I think. Seems like this whole pandemic has turned into a political football, so to speak. Well, there again, it, this is my opinion. Uh, I probably would have, uh, well, there again, I, I can't say that Trump really did a bad job of responding to something that nobody had ever done before. Yeah. So um, I probably would have jumped on it earlier. Uh, there were some people that were, howling or crying in the wilderness saying, this is really bad. This is really bad. And uh, maybe some of his staff didn't brief him well enough. We, if we'd gotten earlier on it, we might've been able to do a little bit better job. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm in agreement with you there. I'm a pretty big supporter of the former president Trump. Uh, I think he did a lot of great stuff. You know, the last couple of months, he, he kind of went AWOL a little bit, but they weren't making him you know, it easy on him really to get anything done anyway. Um, That's true. I've got a friend, a very close friend who was in China the uh, month or two before the, you know, it came over here and hit us here. And he came home and um, he started developing flu like symptoms. He tried to get on the phone with anyone he could as far as government agencies go. And I forget the exact ones he called Department of Health, this and that. And no one returned his calls. No one seemed to care. Um, it turned out that he didn't have the virus, uh, but at least as far as he knows, but no one really seemed to give a crap uh, that he had just returned from China and had flu-like symptoms. So I don't, I don't really understand. Like, I know that we weren't prepared for this, but it also seems to me like we just kind of accepted it saying, Hey, it's going to come here either way. Why even try to control it? Well, the last rendition of this type of thing is called SARS virus. Maybe you've heard of SARS. Yeah. I think it was uh, about eight years ago. Same or a similar manifestation of it. it it came over and uh it was not as transmittable as the coronavirus mm -hmm. and uh, they ex i think they the powers that be and probably in the government thought that was what was going to be about this it turned out it was considerably more transmittable uh it was uh affecting it it was hard to for your body to deal with, you know, just with your own uh, reactions to it. So um, it, it was just a bad. This was just bad. Uh, plus, like I said, it's and it's my opinion. I think the Chinese were actually tamp tampering with the DNA and it, trying to make it hard to kill. Yeah. So that's that's my opinion, but. I don't know. Uh, yeah, you're right. They uh, they probably should have known better, or at least have been prepared. It's you know, um, it's better to have it and not need it than need it and not have it type of thing. It's like those N95 masks. Um, you know, I know people that bought a whole bunch of those before the pandemic hit, and it was like the freaking best investment they ever made. It was like investing <laughs> in GameStop yeah. or something. But um, you know. Other people, they don't really understand about the efficacy of the N95. They just, they, they think that if they wear the cloth mask, they'll be okay. It, it just seems to me like people don't do their due diligence when it comes to this stuff, frankly, at all. <laughs> if, if you will take my education as, as it is, uh, I can give you the short version of that. Okay. The N95 
has enough particulate closure around it that it will protect you from things. Okay. The regular surgical masks that you see out in the population, uh, they don't protect you. You're protecting everybody around you with them. Uh, you really aren't, it really doesn't offer you any protection, but if everybody wears them, then you're, you know, if you have a cough, it, it by and large gets caught by your mask. The N95 is the gold standard and uh, it will actually protect you and people around you because of the fact that it's just capturing very small viral uh, pieces, if you will. I think if we could make those things more available for the citizens that we would have a lot less spread. That's correct. Mm -hmm. But there are a lot of people out there that are saying, oh, we don't need to buy. Well, you know, Fauci has gone uh, two or three different ways on that. So, well, uh, you know, you bring Fauci up and um, I'm glad you did because medical expert talking about this probably isn't a bad thing here on the channel. Um, so Fauci came out originally and said, you don't need masks. It's fine. you would be all right. You're fine. And then he changed his mind, but it turns out he didn't really change his mind. He might've been just lying straight up because we didn't have enough supply of N95s for the, uh, for the hospitals or something like that. Um, was it right for him to lie to the American people or, or what? I don't know. Um, uh... Like I said, it, it seemed like everybody was doing a dance for about two months there until they got a handle on where the end. Well, and I'm not casting aspersions on anybody, but it, it appears that uh, actually even Biden was involved in it. Uh, they ran some of our stockpiles dry during the SARS e epidemic, mm. I think. Uh, and mm. there again, I'm not sure that it was SARS, but it was something. Either that or they just didn't fund it. You know, some things mm. expire like masks and uh, masks may have an expiration date on them and maybe they uh, took them out of the, uh, you know, the national stockpile and didn't fund the re uh, restocking. So, yeah, that's interesting. And you bring up SARS-1 and uh, I'm glad you did because they're finding that people have a... Um, immunity still against SARS-1, the, the patients that had gotten it. Would mm -hmm. that make you hopeful that we're going to have long, long and lasting immunity from uh, SARS-2 from this stuff? My information is that it's going to be like seasonal flu for about 10 years. Mm. In other words, we're going to have to get a shot every year because it's just, it's a very, Agile uh, virus, it can uh, change its color and spots quickly or quicker than our bodies can can uh, deal with them. Mm. So we have to. It's almost like well, you know, we get a flu shot every year, or those of us who who have to get them. Yeah, <laughs> and because I'm a healthcare person, but. Um, my speculation is that's probably true. We'll probably have to have different rounds of them yearly, a new version of the vaccine for a special, probably at the same time, you, they may be able to combine them, you know, the, the seasonal flu and the coronavirus vaccines. I don't, I, that's above my pay grade, but you know. Yeah. And, um, well, I hope it's not like that, but something tells me you're probably right. And something also tells me that, if this was a manufactured virus, then they're going to make it hard to get rid of. So what about the mRNA technology? You know, I was just talking with my mom and she was afraid that it was changing her DNA. And I said, no, it's not. Um, do you, can you speak to us at all about what this mRNA stuff kind of does or? Um, well, there's two different things. The vaccine and mRNA are actually two different agents, if you will. You can get a shot that pre, uh, either pre-tamps down your reaction to certain things, and they do that with mRNA. A vaccine actually 
is going in and trying to elicit a, a, an immune response. Oh, okay. Okay. MRNA, well, case in point, uh, mo, uh, quite a few of the people who have died or have been through ICUs had an overwhelming reaction to the coronavirus. And there are some treatments that you can give people to tamp that down a little bit. And actually it's better uh, mm. because of the fact that their bodies just say, I don't know what the hell this is. And I'm going to, you know, produce everything that I can. And actually it'll overwhelm your own body with your immune system. That's what they refer to as the cytokine storm, right? Exactly. Yeah. Cytokine. Yeah. Cytokine. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, they were seeing, at least during the, the start of this pandemic, a lot of really athletic younger guys and girls were getting it bad. If you're predisposed to getting it, yeah, that, that kind of reaction, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. They were thinking originally maybe it was uh, the immune system. It's just so healthy in these people, but you think it also has something to do with just being like predisposed, maybe a certain blood type or a certain genetics or... well. And in fact, they've already, I think they've already done some tests on it. Uh, type A blood, uh, people who have type A blood are actually more, uh, more susceptible to the coronavirus than other blood types. Interesting. So what do you think about um, the future of the world over the next year or two? I mean, are we going to be going back to normal in the fall or semi-normal or what? You know, just from, from your knowledge, what do you think kind of the process might be like? I don't know. Yeah. I, I really don't. And uh, all I'm doing is uh, watching your blog. And, <laughs> and, uh, I, and uh, I'm, I'm sort of a, I'm not really a full blown prepper, but I'm preparing. Yeah. So uh, I think um, I think that's a wise move. And, um, you know, a man with all of your experience and life experience to sit around and not prepare after seeing it, you know, what's happening in front of our eyes. Yeah. I question your sanity at this point. So, well, my my thought is, uh, well, uh, talking about your blog, um, m my chances of surviving an attack are pretty low because of my age and I'm just not as, you know, as strong as I used to be. That's just an, uh, one of the things of aging. But that also means that I pay attention to uh, my situational awareness and plans for situational awareness are considerably better than they used to be 10 years ago because of the fact that I need to stay out of a problem. Yeah. Uh, even even to the exclusion of doing some things that I'd like to do, I'm, I may stay out of a problem uh, and live to, to talk about it the next day. So, you know, it's amazing how when you're forced to have that level of situational awareness, whether it's because of your age, whether it's because of you're with somebody who's, you know, more vulnerable, whether it's maybe you're living in a hostile environment overseas and you just can't afford to get into trouble, it's amazing how your brain starts to pick up on things that you would have overlooked if you were just, you know, in your prime going out there with the right. visible lat syndrome or whatever. And, um, you know, I also say to that, that's why the good Lord made concealed carry permits definitely helps out. <laughs> yes, sir. It yeah. does. Well, I'm, you know, case in point, and I'm, I'm not trying to be an ad for you, but, uh, you know, talking about uh, counter surveillance techniques. Uh, that, that's a very interesting thing because that might be of uh, help to me because, you know, I'm a, okay, um, I'll, I'll say it out loud and I'll probably regret it, but I'm a, you know, I'm a Trump Repub Republican and I, have a concealed handgun license and this, that, and the other, and somebody put all three of those together thinks, oh, okay, I need to be on somebody's list. <laughs> and um, I'm con concerned a little bit, but 
I would like to know if somebody's following me. Yeah. So, you know, counter surveillance is, um, I, I, I judiciously read every, every word you put down about that. So, well, I appreciate you saying that and I appreciate you bringing that up because I really harp on surveillance, counter surveillance, surveillance, awareness, detection, all of that stuff is because it's half the battle in my opinion and experience is if you can know that somebody is surveilling you, then you're, you're already ahead of the game because they have to surveil you if they're going to attack you, at least in a smart way. So, yeah, I really think that um, if your average citizen could get kind of a grasp on, hey, where do I need to be careful? Hey, when do I need to keep an eye on my uh, you know, rear view mirror or my side mirrors? If I'm walking down the street, hey, how do I just covertly detect if I'm being tailed or followed by somebody there? The situations that it will and can help you with are just endless. But again, if you know, it, look at the example of a lion or um, a cheetah stalking its prey, it has to surveil it before it can attack it. So smart man, I, uh, I appreciate you bringing that up. I do harp on that stuff. And, you know, I appreciate that you find the value in it. I do. Um, so firefighting, I want to bring it back here before we kind of wrap up. And okay. It's a fascinating career, you know, hobby, whatever it was. I know you were a volunteer. I think you were a volunteer fireman, right? Correct. Very little difference between volunteer firemen and career firemen. Um, Absolutely none, except we didn't get paid. <laughs> yeah. Well, the biggest difference is when you're off duty and you're a career fireman, you're off duty. Yeah. Um, well, that's true, too. Yeah. yeah. In the morning. And go to we have fire. to, we get wake, we get wake, uh, awoken in in the night uh no matter whether we're on duty or not so yeah and then you got to go to work the next morning so <laughs> yes in many ways it's kind of more of a hardcore hardcore deal in some respects that's true did you get many good uh good burns uh yeah well i was in a residential area and in fact i was uh the the fire station that i was at uh uh wh where i uh, was a member uh was pretty much covering house fires. We had some businesses, car dealerships and this and other. We were close to an industrial area in the Houston area that, uh, uh, but we weren't the primary fire station for them, but if they got a big enough one, we, we'd go. So we'd help. Did you guys get any training in oil fires, oil rig? Oh yeah. 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 That was, uh, and in fact, we, we carried special foams for, uh, uh, petroleum fires. Mm -hmm. We've got a, our deputy chief actually went to Texas A and M, I think, and uh, right. took Teeth. Whole, like took a whole week course on uh, right and stuff. Texas Engineering External T E E X is where he went. Yeah, okay. I'd love to do that one day. It, it sounds like a blast. They have they have an excellent they have an excellent fire fire uh, training area. Yeah, they do. What's the biggest uh, thing you would think between difference, I should say, between like a structure fire and then like an oil rig fire? Um, question of how, uh, whether you're on defense or offense, actually. Yeah, sure. uh, in the in the case of an oil rig fire, you probably, in, because there's, uh, unless somebody's trapped, you don't have to worry about pe people uh, being exposed. Um, and, uh, so we generally, well, I'm like, say I was one of the grunts when I was, a I was a firefighter. So I'm, I'm, I'm not going to say I'm an expert on it, but generally we fought, uh, you know, uh, industrial and oil fires, uh, from a defensive standpoint, we kept it from spreading. Uh, sometimes we go, uh, offensive just to, uh, make it smaller but generally we stay defensive to let it burn itself out. In the case of a house fire, you can't do that. You gotta, you gotta run in there and, and tackle it as it sits because in a lot of cases we go into a fire, um, a house fire, we don't know if there's anybody in there or not. So. You remember your first house fire? Oh yeah. Yeah. Everyone remembers their first. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I remember it. So what do you think? Um, I ask this to all the guests because it's interesting to see the difference in opinions from different 
kind of personality types. So where do you see us going in the next 10 years? I mean, you, you mentioned about the, um, the flu, kind of the coronavirus being like the flu. But I mean, kind of aside from all of the um, pandemic nonsense mania here, mm-hmm. where do you see America and the world going in the next 10 years? Um, well, I, I do a lot of reading about that. And, and my conclusion is uh, China is going to expand until the rest of the world, in effect, stops them yeah. from expanding. Yeah. And uh, that's not going to be a pretty, uh, it's going to be a, a, a sort of an ugly thing to happen. Uh, I, I see societal collapses and or wars, and I'm not sure in what order or how they're going to happen. So. Yeah, I'm, I got to tell you, I'm with you on that. It's it's a tricky situation, you know. I mean, we've got right now problems here at home, problems throughout the world. Iran's acting like a SOB right now. Um, yeah, Biden's capitulating, but Israel's not having it. It's an interesting situation. Um, China is going to force a world war, <laughs> like you say, probably at some point. Um, and uh, you know, if we're all still here in America four years from now, we'll see what happens. But you think Trump's going to run again, 2024? Um, I doubt it. Yeah. I doubt it. Well, I, I don't know. He's, he's a glutton for punishment anyway. He's been, uh, if I were him, I wouldn't. Yeah. I would, you can exert power other ways. And, uh, or have surrogates do the things that really should have, you know, he, he wanted to do. Uh, it doesn't have to be him necessarily. He, he started the ball rolling on a lot of things that I'm very happy about, and they're going to be hard to curb. Um, you think that if he ran so, in 2024, that would take votes away from, you know, another potentially viable candidate? so to speak? Yes. I I think that would be a problem if we had uh, the Republicans are going to shoot themselves in the foot if they say come up with a different candidate if Trump wants to run. You know who I'd really like to see run is a Texas guy, uh, Dan Kernshaw. Oh. The guy. Yeah. 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 I like him. Crenshaw, Crenshaw, Crenshaw. Yeah. that's the guy. Yeah, he's he's a nice guy. He's very careful, very astute, uh, but you can tell he's he's a fighter also, and uh, he would make a he would make a good uh, run for something like that. All of the all of the people that are Republican in Congress right now, with some exceptions, are fairly old. Yeah. And um, sort of set in their ways. We need maybe young blood in there. If we can do it. Yeah, I was just saying that earlier. Um, forget to who, but I was saying we need we need young guys and girls in the Republican Party and right. ones who uh, who aren't um, you know as outwardly appearing crazy because <laughs> there's a few <laughs> nut jobs in there to in the mix. Yeah. But hey, on the other side, there's some nut jobs too. We're all a bunch of nut jobs, I guess. Right. Well, I. I my yeah. wife considers me a nut job a lot of can, a lot of times. So you might be, you might be. I mean, certainly to freaking do some of the stuff you've done, I, I say you've got a screw loose or two. But welcome to the club. Yeah, an adrenaline junkie is my term for myself. <laughs> uh, you know, I appreciate I appreciate your skill set. I appreciate you coming on. Okay. Please remember that you are your first and last line of defense, and I will catch you on the next tactical podcast.